Celebrating 10 years in the year 2020, NGC Bocas Lit Fest is on, and we are joined by director Marina Salandi Brown and author Andre Bagu to tell us more. Good evening, and we start with you, Marina. Congratulations on 10 years, but I want to ask you the difference between preparing a Lit Fest with some online offerings versus being totally online. Well, um, we've, well, what we've done in the past, the last four or five years, we've actually live streamed. So a little bit, we have a little bit of savvy about that. But doing it this way is a completely exciting and new experience. Um, we didn't know quite what it meant. It meant that you have to hand over a lot of control for what you're doing to, tech, to people who have got the technical expertise. And every time you try to have a conversation with somebody online now, they've got another platform, another way of doing it. And of course, um, you just have to completely put your hands in the, um, yourself in the hands of other people to deliver the thing. So it's the team has got bigger. There's a lot of trust that you have to have because of course I haven't seen the people I work with since um, for many, many months <laughs> because we've been working remotely. And it's a whole new experience. I, I think that um, what is interesting in any group of people working together is that you get to know one another and you get to understand the ethics of a company and working practices, et cetera, by being in the same space and picking it up through the pores. I think that business now faces a real problem because how do you actually get people to, to enjoy that, you know, that learning from one another in that way. It means you can't really, the many things you can't do because you can't really introduce completely new people. So Bocas is very lucky to have had a very dedicated team of people for a long time. Everybody on the team has been there for years. Um, Nicholas Lachlan has been there from the very beginning. And so has Patrice Matthews and other people have been there, you know, eight years or so. And that has made it possible. I don't know how we would have done it otherwise. No, I hear you speaking about trust, I hear you speaking about luck, I hear you speaking about dedication, even loyalty. And we'll come back to some of those uh, topics or those issues in just a bit. But I want to turn to you now, Andre, because I won't ask Marina to toot her own vuvuzela. But um, from your <laughs> point, how does the NGO and festival foster growth locally and regionally among writers? Well, I mean, first of all, uh, thanks so much for having me and congratulations, Marina and Bocas, for this wonderful anniversary. I think looking back over the last 10 years, Bocas has been always on the pulse of Caribbean literature, whether it is the Caribbean in terms of a narrow geographic space or the diaspora. So I think this festival has had so many highlights over the years. Um, it's really been... Um, uh, a joy actually to have uh, attended and participated in several of the events and every year um, I come away thinking you know how why I mean how does this how did they do it you know because you know um, there are obviously limits to uh, what could happen and I think this year though focus has once more risen to the challenge um, and found a way to still engage that international Caribbean diaspora or global uh, audience uh, by turning so effectively to online media. And with regard to that pivot, I want to ask you, Marina, what are some of the activities you have planned in this, in this event coming up? And also give us the dates, please. Okay, so it starts on Friday this week, which is the 18th, and it ends on Sunday the 20th. And what we have is really continuous programming, although we haven't publicized this as such. Uh, we're going to have events more or less starting every hour um, or with a half hour gap in between. But we've actually programmed in between those half hours so that um, it's continuous. Once it starts at 4.30 on Friday and ends on Friday night, starts at, um, you know, at 1.30 on Saturday, ends at 9 or so on Saturday night, and then starts at 10.30 on Sunday and ends at night, it's going to be continuous. And before each of those starting times, there's going to be half an hour of programming. And that, that is comprising um, stuff that's gone before, moments we wanted to remember, not all of them, because after 10 years, you've got hundreds and hundreds of hours of stuff. So um, uh, that's there. But Future Friday is how we theme the first day, which is um, about a speculative fiction and science fiction, you know, which is one of the most popular genres, actually, increasingly popular genres um, among younger people um, everywhere. Then on Friday, and then on Saturday, um, 
one thing I might say is that the whole festival has a rather political air. And it's because also of the commemorations. I mean, 19, we're recalling 1970 on Saturday. And we have many writers. We've commissioned new writing, etc., for that day. And then on this, and, and new writing, new books. And then on the Sunday, there's all of that again. We've got Stand and Deliver, which is a usual, um, the usual outing for new writers. We've got on the Sunday after our main um, discussion of the day, which is about a question of leadership, um, which involves, um, which is about talking, you know, what do we do with all the problems we've got now in the Caribbean? And we've got, you know, former Attorney General Belize, we've got a former Jamaican Prime Minister, we've got, you know, other important people. And then all through the day, we've got, um, you know, we pick up the theme a little bit. I mean, of course, a lot of it is literary, but it's all based on books, but it's not, it's not really about the, you know, um, it's not about people reading consistently. If you've never been to the festival, it's actually about the ideas that come up in their work. And so the jumping off point for a lot of this is the reading, engaging with the authors, but what are we engaging with them about? And those ideas are what the festival is really about. And there are many things, many things in there that are, are worth, you know, joining in for, because a lot of it is new. Well, how do you go through deciding what content you're going to use again because like you said there's been so much 10 years worth how you decide okay well these are these are the the criteria that we're going to be using or just i like this one or how do you go about making those selections well you know it's made easy for us because books are published <laughs> and sometimes there are many books on a theme so a theme emerges so we don't we don't say we're going to have a theme but a certain number of books come up. So, for example, on the Sunday, there's a book about the assassination of Maurice Bishop, together with P.J. Patterson's story of his life. And that's rather um, poignant because, of course, Owen Arthur just died. And he was only, I think he was 70 or 71. And he was one of, he was one of the most important Caribbean leaders in the post-independence you know, post period. But he didn't know he was going to die so young. And so he never finished his book. And so that incredible story, you know, he championed um, the CSME. He, of course, he was the head of the CARICOM trying to sort out that mess in Guyana. Um, you know, he died in the saddle almost. And it's a great loss. I was just talking to PJ Patterson this morning about that. And he, I said, you know, your book reads as if you've been writing it as you went along. And he said, yes, absolutely. I have been doing that. So um, these things jump out at you. I mean, there are many new books. Um, Andrew's written a new book this year. Um, 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 Lizzie Walcott has written a new book this year. Ronnie Groffy has written a new book. Uh, you, um, you know, other people, our, our important new writers have written books, and many of them have gone on to win prizes. So they said it's sort of self selecting in a way. All right. So, Andre, you just, we've just heard that you've written a, wrote a book, and I saw you doing a reading of that. Do you prefer reading virtually, or do you prefer doing a reading where you can? feel the energy of the people around you? Well, I don't think there's any replacement for reading, you know, in the room with the audience, because sometimes that can be so instructive. You can feel, when you feel the energy of the audience, you actually learn things about what you have written that might not have actually registered before um, for all, you know, no matter how carefully it was crafted. Um, and every audience, which is something I have to admit, is completely different. You can read the exact same piece of writing to different uh, uh, people, and you would get a completely different type of response. And we, you would notice certain things stood out to some, certain things didn't. So, I mean, on the one hand, it is it is a loss to not have that live audience. On the other hand. Um, I do enjoy being able to access audiences that I might not otherwise um, have had ready access to. So when I think about uh, the international scope of the internet and you know being asked sometimes to do to participate in virtual events by um, UK uh, or American uh, museums, um, that's something that I couldn't just ordinarily pop up and do. I'd have to you know have a flight and fly to another country and. And that so is a topic a that we want to we want to situation. rejoin as soon as we as soon as we come back from this break because in terms of the scope this is something else that that other people have spoken about and we want to take that topic up when we return stay with us.
Welcome back. We are speaking with Marina Salandi Brown and Andre Bagu about the NGC Bocas Lit Fest and the possibilities and potential that can be unlocked by being a virtual event. Now, we were speaking about scope. Marina, 18 events, 80 participants. How do these numbers compare to previous events? And what do you think the potential scope is like because it's actually a virtual affair? Uh, well, there's no comparison because normally we'd have up to 100 events. Um, but doing 18 events virtually feels like doing 200 events. I can't tell you the amount of work is involved um, in doing it this way because the technical aspect, I mean, normally you would just get all these people in, in a room and then you start talking, you fly them here, you, you know, and they come into the room and they speak. This is not like that. Um, we couldn't possibly do 100 events. I mean, I think we'd all die doing them. So um, the scope for us is huge, although the number is smaller. But as Andre was saying, in terms of the audience, I mean, the audience multiplied exponentially. Although we've been live streaming, we never really sent ourselves, um, we never presented ourselves mainly as an online you know, festival. But it was through the live streaming that lots of people have come to us. Um, now, of course, we're virtual, and I imagine everybody be coming to us. And because we're virtual, DK, what we've had to do, um, not having a physical festival, is we've had to keep up our, our, um, our profile during the course of the year. So we've been working absolutely nonstop all year, and we've been doing, on average, about two virtual festivals a week. We've, we've generated many new projects, which are online projects. Um, where we've managed to, as Andre says, access writers who would normally um, be able to come to Trinidad, you know, to do an interview. And people who we'd invited to the, to the festival this year who would not have been able to come, we've been, we are now being able to engage them virtually. And of course, they're sharing all the stuff. And it's, I think that, you know, the virtual, the virtual element actually introduces a whole new level uh, of engagement. Um, but it's not the only thing because, um, the, the, in, uh, as part of the scope of, of the impact of a festival, of course, is all the networking and the personal um, you know, sh shoulder rubbing and all that, which is not something you can really pick up um, mm. you know, doing, doing, doing it online, although online brings you other advantages. No, Andre, quoting you in your reading of doubles, you said, few biting into doubles know its main ingredient helped to change the world. And we have already started this kind of conversation. So I ask you to continue it. What positives do you take going into a totally virtual event like this? Well, you know, um, one of the events that I'll be participating in uh, in the upcoming festival is called The Personal is Always Political. And I think uh, a good demonstration of that um, is the use of online media, the way not only writers, but I guess everyone, to some extent, um, engages with social media to address the, the issues of the day. You know, before we thought social media was just a, a kind of a, a narcissistic kind of, you know, uh, playful realm uh, in which people experimented. But now we've seen how important social media is in the current context where it's the main tool through which people can voice or engage with whatever the the issues uh, of the day, you know, be it their gripes about doubles to all of these um, more unsavory things that we've seen, uh, we've had to address and confront, you know, such as our colonial history, race, and so on. Um, so I think uh, turning, it is uh, an interesting prism uh, by which we're getting a chance to, to hold up our mirror to ourselves. And that, you, you raise a very interesting question or point and I'll ask both you, Andre, and you, Marina, as individuals who work with words, what would you say or how, what, what have you thought about some of the ways that words are being used and whether or not um, thought has been put into them or they're just people, people talk about having Twitter fingers, um, but the way that words are being used on social platforms now, when you see that, what do you think? And I ask this to both of you, Marina first, please. Well, you know, the word has always been hugely powerful. Um, when you think of the word rhetoric and people who are rhetorical, I mean, those words, and people who have, like Marcus Garvey, who was able to lead a whole world in revolution for black people, 
um, just by the nature of his discourse and what he could do standing on the podium. And when you hear people stand, orators, I mean, you know, silence is golden, is it really? Um, you know, the power of words, I think people really underestimate the power of words. And this is one of the things that we try to talk about a lot in, 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 um, in advocating that people read, is that people don't, people totally underestimate what thoughts are captured and in words and sentences in the covers of books. I mean, everything one needs to know about life and beyond is actually in a book, it's in words. And people are using it very, um, very irresponsibly. And what we have been used to, of course, is the mediation of the priest or the mediation of an editor or the mediation of a publisher or whatever. And now none of that happens anymore. Everybody's a journalist, everybody's a writer. It's not mediated. We don't know what's true, what's not true. Words that, you know, you want some words. I was taught when I was a child that once you put something out there, a word, you can't get it back. Well, that seems not, well, I now know that to be true because what actually happens is that people could say the worst thing about you, which is totally um, defamatory. And once it's out there, there's absolutely nowhere, there's no legal way of redress. You could actually put out a pre-action protocol letter to stop people saying things about you. But you know what? The people who do these things don't understand what they've done anyway. So they just carry on. So there's no legal redress. And it's, it's a whole new world. Um, and it's a very scary world. And I don't think we've caught up with it yet. And Andrea, I want yeah, to... And, I, want uh, to... I agree. And, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead, I, go I ahead please, Andrea. I agree. Yeah, I, I was just going to say I agree. Because one of the things I was... I mean, I was preparing uh, for the... Um, publication of my book, The Undiscovered Country, and then the pandemic broke out. And I began to actually question, you know, is writing relevant? Uh, are words, you know, uh, is all of this going to matter in the face of all these uh, questions of survival that were now um, arising? You know, and um, the events have proven that words are, language is more important now than ever. And it's not just words in books or, or words that people use on Twitter. It's just the entire the entire scope of, of, of media, be it art, um, be it music, be it film, um, how we represent ourselves, how we see represented. I mean, we saw a lot of this in a lot of the campaigns recently for the recently held general election, where there were so many debates about some very um, powerful things that represented language uh, in its true, true kind of form and essence. And I think that is definitely true to say that words now are more important than ever um, and that is really what I think events like the book is the best uh, uh, kind of bring home and underline because words not only um, uh, carry ideas or, or, or silver artistic function but they can have real real life repercussions and with that, that is the perfect note that we're going to be ending on. We want to thank you so much, Andre Bagu, as well as Marina Salandi Brown. The NGC Bocas Lit Fest is on 10 years in 2020, and it's on from September 18 to 20. We want to thank you so much for joining us. On behalf of the entire news team, I'm DK Rasta. Thank you once again for joining us.